We're going to stay on our toes because we'd want to keep the energy going. Uh, and Mario's going to take a flight and he's about half my age. So he's going to stay on his toes because that's how power works. So we're here to talk about IPO. But before we get to that, I want to tell you a little bit about Mario. He went to boarding school in England, Winchester. And he's famous because apparently he was the first Chinese person to lead the first 11 football team. That's true. All right, so he's good at sports. He's good looking. He's good at sports. Are you a bachelor? Uh, you got a girlfriend? Still have, yes. Still, no. okay. Any single girls in the room? <laughs> Obviously not. What do you um, find any interest in? Okay, <laughs> so you, you, did, you went to Winchester, you went to boarding school in England, you didn't get bullied because you were in the first 11. And then you got accepted in Cambridge because you were also apparently quite intelligent, right? Well, my grades were all right, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Straight A's. With a little star. Okay. Grades, you turned down Cambridge, which I think is outrageous. <laughs> and then you went to MIT. Yes, I did. Which is not a bad decision. And then you decided, this is too easy, I'll, I'll graduate early. Right? Uh, yeah, I did MIT for three years. So why, after all of that, are you doing video games? Esports. You're about esports, right? Yes, that's true. That's actually so. Passion. You're so brainy. You're intelligent. You're good at football, and you're playing video games. Well, you see, uh, esports is now officially classified as the 99th sport of the national of the Chinese. So, did you know that? Rebecca, where's Rebecca? Technically, I'm still doing sports-related things. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess to explain a little bit, I did graduate MIT a little early, um, and uh, I wanted to pursue entrepreneurship. Um, instead of what people might expect me of uh, going to casinos in Macau. Um, okay. And I think that route has uh, taken me into some nice twists and turns, and uh, that's why I'm here standing with iDream Sky and an IP. Okay, let's talk about that in a moment. So iDream Sky is in the game publishing business, right? That's true. So you get involved in esports, and you go back to Macau, that you know quite well, and you go, okay, I'm going to set up an esports federation. So tell us how esports and why it's so big and why a company like iDream Sky would want to go public. Okay, well, I guess I'll talk a little bit about esports first in Macau. Um, so until last year, uh, there were basically no esports in Macau. Um, you know, no competitions, no teams, uh, extremely small market. But that's strange because esports actually becoming a pretty big force, you know, all over the world, especially in Las Vegas. Uh, the competitions are driving a huge amount of people to actually watch these competitions. And there's big money in it, right? When people get paid. Huge ticket prices. I yeah. mean, you know, we're talking about an event that I hosted last year. Uh, the official ticket price was 180 Hong Kong dollars. And on the day, it went Just to, to watch. 1,000. Yeah. Just to sit there and watch somebody else play a game. Well, professionals play games. Okay. Um, so in Macau, uh, you know, I basically pulled together all the resources I can from esports, you know, representatives from Tencent. Uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here must have heard of these games, you know, League of Legends, uh, Riot. I should just find out who plays League of Legends. Or, oh. Uh, uh, one, uh, yeah. Mimi plays. plays. That's why she can answer your question, like, isn't it? More, more hands over there. What about oh, PUBG that's... or like Wanzhou? Yeah. PUBG? Wanzhou, yeah. yeah. More hands coming up. Okay. okay. So yeah, you know, these games, uh, we're talking about, you know, tens of millions of people to play, playing it, you know, daily active. Um, and, uh, you know, brought all these guys to Macau, set up a federation. Now Macau's become probably the second most popular city for all these game makers to put their international events. Um, so quick sort of comparison, uh, you know, since 2016, the League of Legends World's Finals has actually exceeded viewership online than the NBA Finals when LeBron James beat Steph Curry. So globally, really same number. Wow. And then, so what's the link to Tencent? Because obviously Tencent know games well. They get most of their money out of games if the government allows them to. So where does Tencent come into the relationship with you guys? Because I believe you've got Tencent and Sony who are backing you, right? So as a company, well, yeah. in terms of why Tencent, you know, related with esports and games is because, well, they own all of them. <laughs> okay. That's one. And, uh, well, with regards to the iGym Sky, our company, iGym Sky is our largest institutional shareholder investor. Uh, they've backed us since Series A. You mean Tencent? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they're the largest shareholder uh, institutional-wise. And uh, at the same time, we have a lot of collaborations with them. Uh, you know, Tencent does games. They publish games themselves. We are still to date the only ever publisher in games that they've invested. Because technically, there is some form of a competitive nature between us. Yeah. Uh, you know, they try to publish Fruit Ninja, Angry Birds, Temple Run. Those guys all came to us. Now, in terms of foreign games coming into China, that level of revenue, we're still number one. 
And uh, that's why, you know, Tencent sees that there are things that us as a company that they can't do. So I guess they invested. So you're young and cocky and they're not. Is that, is that why? Well, you know. <laughs> yes, you can say yes. <coughs> so, okay. So let's talk about IPO because Rebecca was kind of kicking us out there saying talk about IPO. So, you know, iDreamSky was, uh, did an IPO last year, was it? Here in Hong Kong? Yes, uh, in December. And you were involved. What I love is you graduate and the first thing you do is an IPO. A few, is, a few is that, things in between. All right, like you messed around for six months. <laughs> you kind of go, oh, I need a girlfriend, and you played around. And then <clears throat> you do an IPO. How does that happen? Well, um, so I just guy was previously listed on NASDAQ before I joined the company as partner. Yeah. And, and you go, uh, uh-uh, come back to Asia. Well, they came back before I joined as well. Oh, right, it's right, first right. privatized. <laughs> um, and they were actually invited by, you know, officials in Shanghai, I think, you know, years ago when they said, hey, we're going to start a new sector for oh, the new tech, the tech, tech yeah, yeah. yeah. Is that already listed there? Has anybody invest there? Uh, well, it actually didn't happen at that okay. point. So when I took Sky privatized from the US and said, hey, you know, we're ready, let's, let's, let's hit this new board. And, uh, you know, certain political changes and the board literally just disappeared. So I just Sky kind of got stuck becoming a private company for a few years. Now, you know, naturally, they would uh, queue up for H shares, you know, which is the Chinese board. But when I joined, uh, you know, I did tell them the political landscape for games was not going to be pretty in 2018. Um, and I'm really, really in huge doubts that any company from games would actually even be able to list themselves in 2018. So That's because you saw the regulations coming or what was the issue? Regulations were coming. Uh, you know, we actually, uh, through big data, we monitored how the entire country was getting their game license approved. That's interesting. And, uh, what do you mean by through big data? You were trawling government like databases? What well, no, no, not officially. Not officially. <laughs> no, joking, okay, unofficially. But, uh, you know, we realized that games are getting approved much uh, less before yeah. a lot of people did. So, uh, you know, we said, hey, we should actually consider Hong Kong. There's another big reason why we did that is because Tencent, you know, one of the biggest tech giants that's also listed in Hong Kong, one of our biggest allies, we'd actually be able to take advantage of their resources. And actually, then again, if you think about it, the investor base in the U.S., the investor base in Hong Kong, they're quite different. In Hong Kong, we have a geographical advantage. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to every single quarterly report, every single NDR, every single roadshow, it's much easier to explain what's going on in the game sector coming here over in the East. So yeah, this game's quite hard to explain to investors, right? When you go around and do a roadshow, what, what are the kind of questions they ask you, apart from, you know, are you related to him? Do, what, what other questions do they ask you? So last year, practically, we went to uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai, the US, many, many cities, uh, went to Europe as well. So you were even pitching in the US, even though the listing was here, you were going? Yes, yes, we did a okay. huge global roadshow. But the recurrent question that I kept getting asked was about game licenses last year. Because okay. right when we submitted our A1, you know, the government, government practically said hey there is actual ban on this so you know reasons included you know uh, health issues for children yeah. addiction problems uh game uh, too much gambling related games uh that were getting approved you so know, when uh, we were trying to list our company get investors buy our shares uh you know the question was hey how is how are you even going to be able to generate more revenue now that no new games are going to be approved uh, so that was a big question um, and how do you answer that well you go don't worry i've got it sorted <laughs> yeah i know yeah, I know some guys. They come down to Macau regularly. I know, I know where they sleep. Uh, the question, the answer uh, actually went a little bit like this. So last year, uh, firstly, we explained the difference between publisher and game makers. Now, there are different types of companies. It's if you imagine this in the sort of movies industry, we would be the guys that uh, basically take the movies from you know various makers, localize them, translate them, do the little subtitles, and then contact the local cinemas to do the publishing. So that's publishing. Yeah. We don't make games. We don't make this the movies. Now, the other side of the spectrum is the guys that make the movies, the guys that shoot them, and you know, the guys that pay for the actors. Now, in the, game world, in the game world, they're called studios, exactly. Now, they spend all their money every single year on that one hit or that two hit. Now, if they can't get a license for that, their company mm -hmm. is going to be in a huge disaster. So we are a publisher. We actually take many games. So even though one type of movie was not going to get approved, we still have many, many movies that are going to be online. And in the game case, we still had about like, you know, 30 odd games that were running online. So that, that's how the answer went. But then, you know, we did reassure investors. So they were happy with the fact that you, as a publisher, you could spray and pray kind of, you had a lot, you had a lot of different we get to projects out. Yeah, we get to pick. And also, you know, we decrease the risk. Um, you know, do you need licenses for all the things you do? Because I mean, it's not just all the big League of Legends Fruit Ninja stuff, right? You're doing a lot of little small mobile games and things like that. Actually, every single mobile game that gets listed 
on an app store in China it does require does need the license. licensing. So yeah. anyway, that problem has been solved 2019, no more of that. So, so, so you get over the license. So what's the other challenge they, they, they ask you in the IPO world? The fact that you'd listed before in America and withdrew, was that an issue? Um, that was definitely a question that was raised. You know, people ask why you privatized, uh, and, you know, what are you looking forward to in Hong Kong? Um, you know, many, the, the way we answered that question was, uh, well, firstly, we were very transparent. We did say the Chinese local government invited us to come back. So, you know, little choice there. But in terms of being in the US, we do see issues with, you know, the multiple granted to Chinese companies a little low. Uh, you know, not that we are going to do inorganic growth, like, you know, heavily dependent on that, but still, you know, we like that as an option. But with such a low multiple back in NASDAQ, it was difficult to even, like, you know, acquire it. And you think, do you think there's a kind of growing, like Rebecca was illustrating earlier, there's a growing kind of distrust in America. In fact, there's a growing distrust in America in everything, thanks to one big fat guy. <laughs> but do you think there's a growing distrust in technology from China? So it makes sense to list back in Asia because that kind of distrust is not as strong? I don't, I don't think the, the biggest drive was distrust. Yeah. I think the biggest drive was really, uh, it's easier to explain things to investors of the East. Because- uh, I get it. So wh where do you see, you're the CMO of iDreamSky, right? That's right. So what, what does that mean? You go out there and you talk it up. What, what's, the, <laughs> what's, the, what's your job? I mean, what's the vision? You're the CMO, so I have to ask you this. That's true. What is the vision of well, okay. iDreamSky? Um, the first, first thing first as a company, the vision is to be a 24-hour entertainment provider. So we provided 30 minutes of casual games to people when we first started the company. Now we're moving into creating IP, creating comics. We want to do heavy, more hardcore games, take up maybe an additional hour or two. Now we even have an offline business. So we want to be an all-rounded business. But that's so it's, you mean within people's lifestyle? You want to right. be there? Well, we want to take up more hours of the user's time. Okay. Now, as chief marketing officer, the biggest problem that I face, well, aside from brand recognition that I have to do, is that I have to think of more creative ways to acquire users at lower cost. Yeah. So, as you can imagine, a lot of you know, tech giant names that were mentioned before, uh, Douyin, Jiri, Tokyo, there are more and more hot apps coming up and limited supply of ad space. And when everybody starts to basically use cash to buy users, the acquisition cost online is forever going to shoot up. So as a company that heavily relies on having a very large user base, yeah. uh, you know, I have to think about how to do this creatively. You know, how do so do you, is this where the Tencent and Sony relationship comes into play? Absolutely. Can you, you leverage the Tencent's uh, Weixin and all the QQ and all that to, to promote your, yes. to generate leads? Or that's true, that's true. So whilst we saw that the online user's acquisition cost was rising, offline user acquisition became a way that nobody was really exploring, especially for online companies. So that's when we started our offline business in collaboration with Tencent uh, and also with Sony, where we create an entertainment hub where you got esports in there, you got you know the computers, you got mobile gaming, you got you know cinemas. So these are physical. Uh, it's a physical store. So we have about 16 right now all across China. We're going to open up to 100. So we're taking market share from cinemas. We're taking market share from internet cafes. It's a better experience. And when we use Tencent IP, you know, they're attractive games. So for example, like League of Legends and Monster Royale, if you come to our store, link to the Wi-Fi, you can have all the skins for free. Only if you're in our store. So these type of perks drive traffic. They drive people to our store, which we in turn turn them into our online users. So this right. way, is cheaper and then what's the the jd relationship because jd also kind of invested or partnered as a cornerstone yeah. along with yeah. sony uh so with the jd partnership uh, we're trying to gamify the e-commerce shopping experience so you know we do games they do e-commerce there was very little in between now we're making games where uh you know mostly targeted at females where when you switch clothes of the avatar within all games you know we can physically buy the thing on Jing Dong. So That's interesting because I saw there's a move in China now to wear hand, hand clothing, right? So people are going to start buying, you know, period clothes from Le League of Legends and just wear them around the streets. Uh, yeah, I wear Naruto clothes around the streets all the time. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm an interesting You probably get by, you get by with it. So where, where now then? So you've got the vision of the 24 hour. Um, you've got two minutes left. Oh, I do. Okay. Two minutes. So where do you where do you see this going? Is is this something that is just the Greater Bay play, or is this something that becomes Southeast Asia? Uh, we are definitely going international. Yeah. So uh, recently, we have our games being published internationally in Southeast Asia as well. But 
Now that you mentioned the Greater Bay, that's actually really important. The political landscape is the most positive and has the most drive. And the way we're going to position ourselves is to set up our own esports club in the Greater Bay, in Shenzhen. Where, okay. you know, hopefully in 10, 20 years, when the League of Legends League is as strong as the NBA, we would own the Warriors. Okay, so you'd have a club like a, like a proper basketball team with the owner and managers and Absolutely. players. Absolutely, and scouts and youth. Uh, you know, we're talking about the yeah, transfer markets. So how do you buy a club? Can we buy a club? No. Can um, we Bitcoin your club? <laughs> Technically, you could buy a club. Uh, the last transaction that was made, bought by the leading group, spent 300 million RMB for the slot. 300 million RMB. Yep. And you have one too, right? I have one. Well, technically, I can sell it. You have a club? Uh, yes. Okay, cool. So we've got one minute left. What do you want to tell these guys if they were going to invest? Uh, I want to ask if you have a WeChat mini app, mini shop. Uh, we do in the offline stores. And that is one thing that we also link up with like JD and Sony. And that is actually really interesting because every single item we sell on the you know online store, we take a revenue cut. So now when Sony sells a PS4 in China through our stores, we get a cut of that PS4 too. Very nice. That's great, wow. The one more question from the floor. Currently 16. Yeah, but 16. we're gonna aim for over 100, yeah. And Time's we're all based in Shenzhen. And what are yeah? And what are your international plans? Are you going to be in the U.S. at all? Me personally, uh, not too much. Um, in terms of international plans, we want to basically work with our investors first. So we want to take up Sony. Uh, you know that links up Japan, links up Korea. Uh, but in terms of international plans, I think you know China. I really believe in the China market. It's huge. Uh, right now, we have the largest. Uh, monthly active user base of users, we have 130 million uh, in terms of uh, individual game publishers. But still, the pie is too big. Uh, you know, as long as we can take more of the Chinese pie, I think we're good. But still, international things are in plans. So can I just ask one question to you? 10 years from now, are you going to interview him like you did Jack Ma 10 years ago? I, I, all I can say is I'm really impressed with uh, some of the strategies and technologies and marketing ideas I'm hearing. Very good. And okay, time's up. Thank you very much. He has tremendous poise. So you have tremendous poise. That means she fancies you. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks so much, Jim.